Good morning, gamers, or maybe good afternoon if you are somewhere abroad. Welcome to the Gamer Lunch Break. I am your host, Bryce Whitaker, and I welcome you to a very special show of the Gamer's Lunch Break. But before we bring on our guests, let's talk just a little bit about our new releases here at DB Games. We have two new releases for North America that you should be very excited about. The first is a Detective Nightmare in the Mirror. Uh, it is a fantastic detective game in our detective series. Uh, be sure to check it out. Contact your local gaming store and ask them to order today. The other game is Deckscape Crew versus Crew. Arr, matey. It'd be a pirate theme. And in this pirate theme game, it's the first uh, Deckscape that you can play team versus team. So get a couple teams together, uh, go to your local game shop, and try it today. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to bring on our special guest today. He is Mike Webb, uh, Vice President of Alliance Games and uh, Marketing and Customer Service. Mike, welcome to the show. Good morning and afternoon. How are you, Bryce? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I am better than I deserve. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk a little bit. Everybody is excited for the pandemic to end. Yeah. Um, there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I know myself, I am uh, a little tired of online play. I can't wait to get back to playing in person. And in a couple of weeks, because we've all had our vaccinations, we are going to be able to do that. Um, so with this pandemic, how how are gaming stores doing? I, I've read uh, a report that came out at the very beginning of the pandemic. And it said that 20% of game stores might fail, one in five. Has that been the case? No. Um, I've, I've always said our industry itself is recession resistant. And as it turned out, we were very pandemic resistant. Um, I think at the beginning, um, it was unsure for a lot of businesses and, and banks were unsure. So money, you know, money seized up. I think there were a lot of challenges early on. And I think there was there was legitimate reason for a lot of people to be concerned. Um, as the pandemic went forward, the fact of the matter is we're a recession resistant industry. We are very entertainment dense for the dollar. So you get a lot of value for dollar spent in, in our business um, versus going to the theater and seeing a movie. One night you spend fifty dollars, you spend fifty dollars on a game. You've got multiple nights of entertainment, maybe years of entertainment. Right. Yeah. Um, so what we've seen is stores adapting to curbside at first and now, you know, limited in-person shopping as we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel with vaccination and with, you know, the, the, the general marketplace opening up, I think we're going to see a passionate return to in-store play, both organized play and casual in-store play. And uh, so it, it, it wasn't the nightmare that we expected. I'm sure for some people th there were very legitimate challenges and there were challenges that were different in different areas. Certainly New York and, and California have had many more challenges than, you know, than the Midwest. Right. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, we've seen what we often see in our industry. And that is that the, the retailers in it are inventive. They come up with ways to deliver the deliver the excitement and deliver the escape that is our industry. Um, and when do people need escape more than now? Right. So it's been it's just been great seeing the the reengagement of lapsed players coming back into playing and people who, you know, board gaming was a casual little side thing. And now they're playing a lot of games with their family. I think we're going to see the industry overall explode and come roaring back even better than we were before um, coming up very soon. Great. 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 I know I, I'm, I'm very excited for this. For people that don't know uh, out there, uh, maybe just casual gamers, what is uh, Alliance Games? What is the business that you, you work in? Sure. <laughs> Alliance Game Distributor is the largest hobby, re a hobby game distributor in the United States. Um, if you take the combined companies that, that are our parentage, we go back 45 years. Um, and we have been distributing since D&D &D was young. Um, and we've seen every iteration of change in the game industry. Uh, we currently distribute to around 3,000 retailers in the predominantly in the U.S., but a few hundred overseas as well. Um, and we are, um, we like to think that we are 
the, the, the best company to work with in that regard. We uh, focus a lot, not just on, on, on selling product, but on marketing product um, through Game Trade Magazine, which is a monthly magazine we publish, as well as Game Trade Media, um, which is our online component. Our job is to provide pull marketing, to, to get people excited about games that are coming and be able to connect those consumers that are excited about an upcoming product with a friendly local game store so that they can pull that business through them. So we just try and help make the connections, help uh, stores better gauge what to order on new products, see what's hot further out, so they can make plans with uh, whatever limited budget they may have to, uh, in order to take ruthless advantage. <laughs> now, I wanna show everybody out there who may, who may have never seen the magazine. Uh, this is GTM. Uh, this is, stands for Game Trade Magazine. Uh, and it is, uh, it is the place to find the information on what, what's hot, what's coming, uh, and, and get excited. And one of the situations in the pandemic is, you know, for a lot of gamers, word of mouth is, is like the number one way to find uh, a game. And when your word of mouth has been shut down because you can't go to your center where you talk and communicate, or uh, you know, it's it's not holding an event because of the pandemic. Uh, this is this is probably uh, uh, the best place. To go. Uh, and I can't I can't rec I mean I can't. Th th this magazine has been in my life for a number of years, and um, I, I recommend it. You can't live without it. Uh, and Mike, I just want to say that your team has done a fantastic job with this magazine. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're holding right there the first issue of our 21st year in publication. Wow. 20, 21 years. How 21 years. Yeah. OK. Well, let's talk uh, um, a little bit about what game stores did um, to get creative in this pandemic. Have you had any uh, good stories about um, the innovative workings of game stores and, and oh, how sure. they survived this? You know, there are a number of stores that, 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 you know, very quickly adapted to limitations on, on their store hours. Um, uh, Pat Fugge runs Gnome Games in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and his he started a delivery service up. And there were some other people that independently were doing that as well. But he really did a fantastic job of reaching out to the community and, and being able, hey, you can't come get games from me. I'm going to bring the games to you. Wow. Um, curbside delivery, uh, our industry was one of the, the first to adopt it and adopt it very vigorously um, in, in order to provide the product. Also, there were a lot of changes. Our industry revolved a lot around organized play and a lot around the, you know, the, the game store being the cheers of, uh, you know, for, for, for those that remember the old, the old TV show, right? You, you walk in and everybody knows your name, Norm. Um, and, and at the point where Norm and, and Cliff are having to drink beers over Zoom together, it, it was awkward. But our, our stores adapted to making sure that they're delivering product and also delivering product appropriate to the time. Um, we saw a lot of family games. Um, so if I'm, if I'm at home, I'm going to be playing some family games around the table. We saw a resurgence of a lot of role-playing games as Roll20 and other online components made it possible to engage in that hobby over, uh, uh, online in, in better ways than we've done in history. And a lot of those platforms really grew over the last year and became more user-friendly or adopted new, new features based on the demand that was there. Um, people playing games over Zoom, playing, you know, all, all these options. We started really looking into what games fit with that. Uh, one of the interesting things I've seen is over the last year, we've had an absolute explosion in sales of miniatures, paints and accessories. And it feels like it's it. people were jumping in. They can't go in and play their big, you know, 40,000 point uh, you know, miniatures game at the store right now. But they can sure as heck get some armies ready. And so we saw a lot of people doing some amazing paint work, showing off, you know, showing off, you know, building cities of, of, of buildings for the games and building terrain and building out a, a, a lot of a lot of terrain that's going to look great on the table, getting their armies ready, ready for what's around the corner right now as we get to the fall and it becomes safe to gather together in the numbers we're talking about gathering. And that's going to feed on itself. Yeah. What's going to happen is as we get back into the stores, people are going to be excited to be there. They're going to be showing off what they've done over the last few months. And our industry has always been about spectacle. You walk into a store and you hear people in the back. Yay! You want to be part of that. 
Yeah. yeah. You so as we start to re-engage that again, I think a lot of these lapsed customers that came back during the pandemic are going to re-engage even deeper or people that wander into the game stores that may have you know played a little bit or have been playing some family games. They'll rediscover the joy of social games. They'll rediscover the joy of role playing and you know creating a story together. They'll rediscover the joy of painting an army and then trouncing your best friend with it and trash talking them while you do it. So we're, we're primed. We're primed right now. You think for a, 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 a resurgence in, in, in game store events. There's just going to be a full calendar. And yeah, gonna and be not, and not just organized play, but casual play in store. I think what you're going to see is um, a lot of stores are, I mean, they, they've done well, but there's still challenges in regards to distancing, et cetera. They're not going to be quick to say, let's have the crowds that we had two years ago. But the, there's going to be a comfort zone with people that come in to utilize gameplay space and it not have to be managed space at that time. Um, the, the, we've got a few projects going with some publishers right now that in the past we've done some casual play leagues with, and we, we hope to make some announcements very soon on those. Um, but the idea being creating reasons to come into the store to play that don't require that overhead, uh, you know, the overhead management of the play space area um, while still creating excitement and creating that nexus for the, for the entertainment hobby that is the store. I think that's great. Uh, we here too are primed for this return to game stores, and I am I am thrilled to be bringing the Italian uh, Bang Championships to the U.S. Uh, yes. It'll be a little different. Uh, maybe how a little old is that game, Bryce? How many years? Uh, we're going on twenty next year. Twenty years of Bang. Uh, so we're going to bring it to North America. Organize play in your game store. Get a prize. Get a chance to go to Gen Con. If you win Gen Con, uh, you'll be a national champion. You get to go to Essen uh, and compete in a, in, a, in a bang tournament over there. It'll be uh, it'll be amazing. Yeah. Excellent. But we are we are really looking forward to the new uh, the, the post pandemic game store experience. Yes, Mike. Let me let me pick your brain a little bit out there uh, as a, just a gamer, and the segment of uh games has changed over time we, we of course you and i've always talked about the 60s and the, the rise of the war game uh and that fed into role playing uh but casual gaming has picked up tenfold in the last few years yes. what what's this segment like compared to how how many people out there are war gaming how many people out there are casual gaming or family gaming what what's the breakdown there yeah, I think the family – part of the interesting thing is over the last few years, we've started to see some of our previous categories start to morph together, right? When, when you think of family games, you know, I, I would think of some light strategy games, but not, not real deep strategy um, versus, you know, more crunchy European style, um, deeper strategy games. And we're starting to see that line blurred. Um, we're starting to see more games, uh, I, I think, like Wingspan and others where it, it's accessible – it's not necessarily a very, you know, uh, geek oriented uh, framing story for it. So it's a little more accessible to people in general, but there's some really deep strategy there. Um, and, and we're seeing that across a lot of other categories also. And as we've seen casual games and family games rebirthed in friendly local game stores, as well as a significant section of Walmart and Target and stores that they used to be shrinking in, um, that's creating an on-ramp situation where th there's no way that those mass market stores can carry a tenth of the titles that have popularity. And that's creating an on-ramp that's bringing people into more and more gaming. But to, to, to your specific question, um, we, we've just seen the categories kind of morphing. And, and there's I don't think there are as many deep, crunchy, you know, moving chits around with tweezers, war gamers anymore. Um, there's some of that simulation quality that's actually better online than it's going to be than, or on a computer than it's going to be face to face. What's unique is seeing the way people are creating new games that are still strategic, that are still creative, that still involve uh, involve your mind deeply, involve uh, and, and, and are really beautifully executed as never before and making them adaptable for the for the tabletop surface. So while, uh, you know, you, I, I, I don't look back and see a lot of the Avalon Hill War Games across five Aprils was one of my favorites for Civil War. Right. I don't see that 
doing as well in our in our current industry. But there are plenty of strategic combat sims. There are plenty of of games that capture that feel of command and control and do it very well. And then you've got storytelling games. More and more games tell a story. Uh, Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is this you know fantastically selling board game. It's also very much role playing. Um, and, and you really get that feel with a lot of the other games from Zombicide forward, uh, you know, as, as Kickstarter kind of exploding onto the scene. You've got so many games that have that tell a story in the course of play and that story becomes sticky and affects your next play and your next play. And uh, I think that's, uh, you know, that's that's people want to be into stories. They want to be telling stories. Yeah, and it's interesting to bring it up that the the the, uh, the morphing uh, of, of the particular categories, you know, like um I, I at first was not a big Euro game fan because Euro games typically in the early days lacked a lot of theme, lacked a lot of um, interest in story. But you take a game like Stronghold that has this uh, um, Euro mechanic, but it's tied to this great castle siege. And right. I mean, look, terraforming Mars. Yes, yes, yes. All of these are, are, are kind of combining segments of the of the the game experience and and making taking the best things i think from from everything yeah uh, to, to form some pretty fantastic play experience and at this at the same time we're starting to see a lot of titles that are classics um both some new classics uh, uh, galaxy truckers got a new edition coming this fall right um as well as you're talking about bangs got its 20th anniversary coming up next year there's a lot of product that's got some excitement around that have been around a while um, and that are getting some renewed interest. And and so we've got that at the same time, we've got new things coming in. Um, I, I was just looking at numbers today as we're putting together POs for the Dune board game, which came out from Gale Force 9. We got a Dune movie coming up, right? It was supposed to have come out last year. That was originally an Avalon Hill game. And it's done phenomenally well. And it's a, it, it tells the story. You feel like you're part of, you know, trying to control the spice on Arrakis. Um, Direwolf Digital did a Dune card game. Uh, it, well, it, it's card component, but is 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 you know intrigue play Dune Imperium that has been you know amazing. So there's so many different things coming together. I, I think about your line, um, Deckscape and Detective. One of the one of the interesting things we've seen is a lot of of you know escape rooms were booming before the pandemic, and people love that experience. And now during the pandemic, escape rooms weren't really doing a lot. So now we had to adapt to that and we had to to so, so people are able to experience that or able to experience that kind of mystery solving in, in those games. And as those stores are coming back, they are realizing there's a connection to be made there. They don't just make the sale of the of, you know, if if I come to an escape room, there's a season it's got that it's going to be doing this one mystery. I can't go back the next night. And play the same one. Now, some places obviously have multiple rooms, right? So I can play through different adventures or different stories. But I can walk away from that counter with pocket experiences I can take home and have people enjoying it. So I love seeing what you guys are doing with that. It's it's it, it's just an exciting time. And as we reboot, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Great. Brian here uh, says Netscape is a, a fun game at home, escape room game. I, I agree Thanks. with you, Brian. Thanks for thanks for showing up and commenting on that. Um, mysteries and puzzles are big right now uh, yeah. and they're exercising a part of your brain uh, that you kind of want to exercise during a, a pandemic. Um, yeah, you know, all of this is, is, is really turning out to be, you know, for, for such a bad global event, uh, the, the games are not, o- not only surviving, but kind of uh, are thriving. Yeah. Um, and I can't wait to see what, what the future holds. What do you, what do you see in the next year in, in our business? What, what is, is there a trend or a, a particular kind of game or a thing that you just go, wow, this is, this is going to be huge? Uh, well, a couple of things I'm, I'm excited. Well, three things I'm really excited about. Uh, number one, I, I was born into this industry. I, I, I've been in the industry for 25 years now, and I have been a gamer since puberty, so 41 years. Um, and I, I cut my teeth on role playing, like many people that are part of this business did. Um, so role playing games are really exploding back in. And as people are able to play together, Again, I love Roll20. I love what we've seen with different online platforms able to engage that that play. 
But there's something about sitting across the table from someone physically and joining together and the camaraderie that it creates outside of just the game. It's all about the metagame. It's all about that, that friendship around the table. And, and, and you played in the Star, uh, Star Trek game I was running. You know, yes. you've got the crew around the table, man. It's, it's fun stuff. Um, and, and there's... There's a lot going on in that category right now. I'm, I'm excited about several different games that are out there. Um, one of the biggest of the 90s was Vampire. I mean, obviously, we've seen D&D doing amazingly well. Fifth edition is still through the roof. Fantastic. And as WizKids has been doing a lot of 3D you know, structures for it and 3D figures and just the content to be able to play visually on the table is better than it's ever been in the industry. Um, meanwhile, Renegade's got Vampire coming back out, which was one of the first. Uh, it wasn't the first. There were other horror stories that you, that you role played, Chill and others. But it was one that just captured so much attention that the tragedy of that story. And, and the gothic horror of, of taking a look at, at the 90s and putting an even more dysfunctional twist on it and to look at, at just how the world of darkness was. Um, Renegade's got that coming back out this summer. Um, there, there's so many different, um, different opportunities here. Cyberpunk uh, relaunched recently, and it's been going through the roof, both the video game and, and role-playing game, and there's, there's just so many different iterations of play in that. So I'm excited about storytelling games, number one. Uh, number two, uh, the, the last year and a half has given an opportunity for people to get out of the compressed production cycle. Um, we, no one's been as rushed to get product to market. Part of that means there are some games that we've seen in development that I am very excited about. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about some of them with you later on. There's, you know, take a look at game trade and see some of the other exciting. There are some innovations in gameplay and some innovations that are just beautiful, artistic in their own right, and amazing gameplay that are just around the corner. And we're going to have a new audience ready for them when they hit. Um, and the last bit of it is, as much as I'm a huge role player, I love miniature games. I love creating with my hands. And we have a year's worth, a year and a couple of months worth of miniature gamers spending time like i said crafting those minis getting them ready to play being ready to go to the table and there's going to be some beautiful games that are going to show up as cons start to become safe and 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 places that people are congregating again i can't wait to see what creative minds came up with over the last year that they had two years or or a year and a half to get ready for the table instead of just three months to get ready yeah. So I'm jazzed, man. There's just no other way to put it. I'm excited about all of that on top of all of the already exciting things our industry always has. And I'll tell all the folks out there that we're talking about theme and art and minis and, and uh, uh, story. And, and for anybody who's a big fan of, of us, DB Games, you're going to see Wonder Book in the fall. And Wonder Book is all of this, all of these things, a great story, great art, great miniatures. Uh, a board that is unique and fantastic. Um, and I, I'm so excited that this is kind of a moment when all that's coming together. Um, it, it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be a great fall. I, I was in tears seeing you you show me it the other day, Bryce. So I can't wait till we can talk in, in more detail about it. It's yeah. truly something beautiful. It's great. I think it's going to be great. Let me ask you, Mike, as a gamer in the pandemic, what are some things I can do to help our industry. Sure. Um, I, I am I am convinced as as 25 years professionally in the business and, and like I said, 41 years in, in the business as a consumer, um, I'm convinced that the friendly local game store is the lifeblood of our industry. Um, certainly there's the mass market which can pull huge numbers on a limited number of titles. Um, but the lifeblood of our industry is a, a cheers bar in every town where people know your name, you walk in, you know it, where you've got employees that know products and are able to guide people to the right product for them, not just guide them to the best selling product that might or might not fit their family. They, they know you there or they want to get to know you in that local store. So I think the biggest thing you can do is look for your friendly local game store, engage with them and, and do commerce with them. You may pay a little bit more, than you do, but the service you're going to get is amazing. And more to the point, the service you do the industry overall by keeping it healthy, 
keeping the local store vibrant, a place to gather, a place to come and be yourself and gather with other like-minded people. I've lost count on how many people uh, I used to run when I first, before I got into the industry professionally, I helped a local game store run role-playing games. And part of the idea was it was an open table. Everybody was welcome to come in. I know tens of people that played in those games that came out of their shell that were very insular and very, very, um, they, they were shy and they, they weren't able to really engage in gaming together, seeing there's other people like them, brought them out, but also socialized them and, and, and gave them the ability to interact in, in ways. And I'm excited to see the careers that they've gone to be in. I feel old, but I feel like I'm, I'm a grandpa looking at, at some kids that have really made it and gone, gone places in the world. Um, and all of that comes back to that friendly local game store. It's, it's not a, you know, it's not a huge chain. It's, it's people, you know, and so the biggest thing you can do is engage at the store level, support them, be a part of what they're doing. If you're not ready to be in store playing, that's fine. Don't do it until you're ready, but engage with them for, for purchases and for, for thoughts and, and engage with them on social media, help talk them up. If you've got people that are looking for a good game, recommend your friendly local game store and say, Hey, talk to Bob here. He'll tell you what's hot, but he'll also point you to a game that's going to work with your family that, that he knows you can play with a 10 year old and a six year old or with an 18 year old and a 15 year old. Um, really, that's that's the nexus and the crux of all of it. Without that piece, a lot of the business falls apart because games don't incubate. They don't grow to that level where they become something mass market even has a care about. Um, and you're not creating an audience of people for whom gaming is a lifestyle. You're creating an audience of people for whom gaming is a commodity. And I much prefer having gaming lifestyle people than people that are looking to buy and sell commodities. I think it all comes down to the idea of um, community. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it's, it's what you make of it. And you don't have to play in a game store. Um, but you go to a game store, and in a game store, you might learn about games. You right. might be able to tell people about games. And even if you pay a little more in that experience, you're, you're creating, you're supporting, you're uplifting your community. Um, right. And even if your community is home gamers, but you go to game stores, you're still supporting supporting that community. And you may discover a new game that's perfect for your home group. Or a new game that's perfect for your homeschool umbrella. I've got, you know, we've got teachers that, 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 that incorporate games in classrooms. We've got parents that homeschool that have discovered games and great ways to socialize within that group. There's just so much. It's it's rich beyond just a transaction. It is a place of wonder and a place of discovery. Yeah, it really is. Well, Mike, I have enjoyed having you on the show today. Thank you for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule. My pleasure. I would love to have you back in a few months and we kind of look back on this show. Absolutely. What happened, what didn't, and where we are. Um, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for everybody watching, everybody catching us on a uh, replay. And I will see everyone next Friday. For Mike Webb, I'm Bryce Whitaker. This has been Gamer Lunch Break. We'll see you next Friday. Bye-bye.